a reading from Genesis. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise up from the earth and water the whole face of the, gra the ground. And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to, to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man you may freely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, well, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. The word of the Lord. So here we are again at the beginning. Even though this year's September, mm, the beginnings this year look a lot different than they often do, there are still some similarities. The weather is starting to turn to fall. The kids are returning to school in one form or another. Church is finding its way back to some kind of in-person worship. And we begin a new cycle of the narrative lectionary. And so we start again at the beginning with the creation story. A very familiar story. One that most of us can tell without any difficulty. However, that when asked, most of us would tell a version of the story that's a bit of a hybrid, a mixture of the two separate creation accounts that happened at the beginning of Genesis. The first one, the poetic one, is the one that has seven days, light and dark, and goodness. The second one, parts of which I just read, creation happens in a much different order. In the first one, God says everything is good. And the second one, man is almost the first thing to be creative. And it's the one, the only one that includes what is often called the fall. 
Now, I think we've talked before about the fact that I don't believe that this story is true. But that I do believe this story holds truth. One of the downfalls of the Enlightenment was that people started to claim that in order for something to be true, it had to be factual. It was the beginning of the scientific method. But the people who heard and read this story for the first three, three and a half thousand years of its existence were not troubled by this kind of distinction. So while I don't believe that this story is written in such a way as to be factually accurate, I do believe that it is absolutely true. I believe that the tellings of the creation story in the Bible are story, allegory, if you will, in which we discover who God is and who we are and how God intends for us to relate to one another, to creation, and to God's self. In this second account of the creation story, one of the things that I so appreciate is how clear it is that God does not create and then walk away. But rather that God seems to really enjoy spending time in the garden with these creations. And it seems that these creations, Adam and Eve, really enjoy God's company. And in this, I think we see this relationship filled with trust and reciprocity and love. Kind of a model for us to look to. But one thing that I always get stuck on in this story is how this God who likes, you know, to spend time and wander around the garden with Adam and Eve would tell them to eat anything they wanted except for the fruit of the tree that's right in the middle. I mean, it seems to me like a bit of a setup. It's like dangling candy in front of a baby. I mean, let's be honest, if there is one thing that we know about humans, it's that the very first thing that they want is the thing that you tell them they can't have. But then I read something once that asked a question that really kind of flipped that on its head for me. What if what if they were meant to eat the fruit from that tree? Just not yet. Wow. What if Adam and Eve had been meant to gain the knowledge of good and evil, but instead of on their terms, on God's terms, in God's time, not their time? What would that mean? Would it have meant that they would have learned of their nakedness but not been ashamed of it? Would it have meant that they would have known that they did something wrong but instead of hiding from God that they would have sought out God for healing? Very interesting question. And my other thought is this. Adam and Eve and God lived in this really solid and trusting relationship. And I think that the serpent didn't so much tempt them to sin as much as it made 
the humans question God's trustworthiness. The serpent told them that God lied. And it was in the creation of that, that doubt in their minds, that questioning, that they turned away from God and reached out for something that would apparently make them more like God. Like they wanted to become God. This story of the first humans and their fall into sin, as it is known, it's not just something that happened a long, long time ago. Rather, it's a story that happens to all of us at some point. Their story is our story. At some point, we all lose our innocence and we come to know good and evil personally. This story teaches us that we make choices that lead us toward death instead <clears throat> instead of the abundant life that was meant for us. The very life that Christ said he came so that we might have. We all come to a point, many points, when we ask ourselves whether we trust God and what we have been told and given. Depending on the day or the circumstance, maybe the answer is yes. Yes, we do trust God. And maybe sometimes we don't. But either way, we make choices out of that reality. And then we live with the fallout of those choices. And indeed, we gain awareness of good and of evil and a knowledge of ourselves, and who we are and what we have. And we live with broken relationships, all to one degree or another, imperfect, broken because once you know good and evil, once that innocence is lost, then trust isn't something that is given without question ever again. Harold Kushner writes, I suggest that the story of the Garden of Eden is not an account of people being punished for having made one mistake and losing paradise because they were not perfect. It is the story of the first human beings graduating and evolving from the relatively uncomplicated world of animal life to the immensely complicated world of being human and knowing that there is more to life than eating and mating, <clears throat> that there are such things as good and evil. They enter a world where they inevitably make many mistakes, not because they are weak or bad, but because the choices they confront will be such difficult ones. But the satisfactions will be equally great. Krishna continues, while animals can only be useful and obedient, human beings can be good. The story of the Garden of Eden is not a story of the fall of humanity, but of the emergence of humankind. Hmm. So here's the thing. This story 
is totally and completely true. Humans will doubt, question, and make bad choices, even when everything around them is paradise. But what we see is that even though the image of paradise gets shattered, God doesn't stop wanting a relationship with them. And that is a truth that remains true to this day. God wants to be close to us. God loves us. God looks at what God creates and calls it good. And fortunately for us, our God is a God who does not easily give up. No matter how often we question or make the decision that will alienate us from God. <clears throat> In fact, the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, as we will examine them this fall, are evidence of a God who tries again and again and again to rebuild, reform, and recreate good and healthy relationship with God's creations. And when that doesn't accomplish everything God wants, God does more. In the end, God sends Jesus, another human being, to help us understand truly how much God loves us and still wants to be in relationship with us. What is most certainly true our God is relentless. God can be trusted. That is the truth. And that, my friends, is the good news. It is us who sway. Us who stumble. Not God. Our God is persistent and unyielding when it comes to us. Our God will not leave us or let us alone. God loves us just too much to let go. And that, my friends, is very good. Very good indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>